everybody. How are you doing this morning? Y'all can be seated just for a minute. We do have a couple of announcements. And we want to pray for our team that is in West Virginia. We'll be headed home before long. Uh, they're in West Virginia right now. Uh, but the two quick announcements are the same ones we've had for the last couple weeks. Um, so we have upcoming here in three weeks, we have our men's discipleship breakfast. Uh, from 7 to 11 that morning, and I have sent out, and I'll send it out again this week, I've sent out um, an Eventbrite link where you can sign up, register, so we know how many people are coming. I sent it out uh, probably a week and a half ago, uh, but I'll send it out again um, either this afternoon or tomorrow, so you can check that out, let us know where you're coming. If you can't sign up through that link, that's fine, just send me an email or send me a text and let me know you'd like to come, and, and we'll get you signed up for that. So that's coming up in a few weeks. Uh, and then our counterculture study is continuing uh, this week, week two. I hope your studies went well this past week. Um, I know ours did, so looking forward to uh, jumping into the next topic there. So we'll let you find out what that topic is when you get to get to the Bible study. It'll be a secret until then. Actually, you can just search for it on Google if you want to and figure it out, but we'll let it be a secret if you don't feel like doing that. Um, <laughs> Uh, our ministry team um, of, I believe it has been Tom and Pam, and Mike and Tirza, and Bo and Jody, and Joel, and Martha and Linton, right? I think that's the whole team? Yeah, cool. yeah I did say Tom and Pam. Um, have been in West Virginia for the last few days. Uh, Jody's been leading some art classes for the community there, bring people into that uh, church opportunity to just build relationships and, and share the gospel and uh, good reports from that. Um, they'll be headed home today. Sorry for that crackle. Don't know what that's from. We'll just deal with it. Uh, they'll be headed home today, probably after, around noon or maybe after lunch. So pray for that trip back from West Virginia as they head back. Um, and then uh, I saw something, too, that I wanted to just mention this morning in prayer. And, and it, you know, the, the third verse of that song we just sang, I told Christy after, I told the band after we practiced it this morning, I don't remember singing as a child when I sang this song. Um, Deathbeds are coming. And so, for you and for me, right? It's true. And Chrissy said that's because we always sang first, second, fourth verse. We never sang the third verse of the song. <laughs> so it can be it could be one of those things that's discouraging, but at the same time, it's just it's just real. It's just reality. And it brings about the urgency, right? The urgency of of, of what God has called us to and going into the nations, going to our communities, starting here at home and then going out and, and proclaiming the gospel. And I heard a story last night, saw an update on it this morning that just reinforces that need and uh, how people's focus can be on something so trivial. Um, there was a soccer match in Indonesia yesterday, and the team had not lost a home match in like 23 years or something like that. And they lost. And the fans were so upset by it that they rioted came on the field um, to more or less go after the ownership of the club for losing a home match for the first time in 23 years. Sounds silly and tragic because in the process, at this point, last count I saw this morning, because of the stampede that occurred as a result of the police trying to fight back with tear gas and things like that, 174 people have lost their lives oh. from a soccer match. Um, so, there's, I know that's, ooh, that's heavy, but that's, that's a reality of, 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 it's a reality of this world is that you don't know, right? And so Jesus is calling, He's saying, come, come home, come to me. And we have a, we have a call to proclaim um, the gospel wherever we can. And, and being Indonesia, I don't have a lot of, of expectation that many of those um, 174 do Christ. And so it's, it's a heavy thing. It's a sad thing. We see that. You see the numbers. I, the last number I saw a couple days ago from Florida was 42 people had passed away as a result of the hurricane. I don't know if anybody's seen an updated number from that. They were continuing to search houses and stuff like that. So it's just, it's a reality that's a harsh reality um, in a world that desperately needs Jesus. Amen. And so I, I'm sorry to bring such heaviness in, but it is a reality of, of the world. It's a reality that, that comes in because of the result of sin, and there is, there is death. Um, but then we have this hope. Oh, for the wonderful love he has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon, pardon for you and for me. So may we be people who go out and proclaim that pardon, proclaim those mercies, and proclaim that hope uh, passionately, boldly, courageously, um, 
acknowledging that, that Jesus is it. Um, we get passionate about our sports here, um, sometimes silly passionate. Um, remember that victories aren't, victories and losses are what matters. Jesus is it. And so, may we proclaim, may we proclaim the truth um, to a dying world that needs Jesus. So I want to pray for us, and I want to pray for those people in Indonesia and those families and, and the Christians who are in that area that, that they would see ministry opportunity. For those who have uh, uh, seen a loss of life as a result of Hurricane Ian and, and property damage and those types of things, um, that God would bring rescue in the midst of that. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Uh, Lord, first of all, I want to, I want to um, uh, thank you for the success that the, the team in West Virginia has seen this week. Um, Lord, I want to ask you to protect them as they come home, um, Lord, and, and use what they did this week to draw people in to maybe some fellowship and community and relationship um, with the name community church there, Lord, that we might see your truth spread through that community, uh, Lord, a, a community that is in desperate need, a community that sees people dying from, from drug overdoses and, and those types of things uh, regularly because of the economic depression in that area, um, Lord. Your gospel is reach out. Uh, it's so powerful to, to change that whole community. So we ask that you would continue to do that work um, in Welch, West Virginia. Thank you that our team was able to be a part of that. And Lord, for these people in Indonesia who well, was supposed to be just a fun soccer match, turned into tragedy, and so many families uh, in, uh, in despair today as a result of that. Something seems so senseless yet that you can use or just encourage the Christians to speak truth into that and comfort into that uh, situation that we might see um, see a revival even begin in that area. Um, Lord, and for those affected by Hurricane Ian, many uh, finding out over the last couple days that loved ones have been lost. Um, you know, so many people in such dangerous situations, in some cases miraculously, Saved. I saw a video of a house being washed away where the residents were still in the house, but then reports that those residents managed to cling on to trees and things like that and, and survived. And so there's also miraculous stories, Lord, whether it's in the tragedy, the realization of loss of life, or the realization of miraculous rescue, Lord, may all those affected turn their eyes to you Lord, and see you as their one hope of salvation. So, Lord, continue your work to, by your spirit, reach to the hearts of people, Lord, who need you, and may we be an integral part of that here in Lake Country and beyond. Uh, Lord, would you uh, give us joy today as we sing together, as we look into your word, and Lord, would you give us a drive and a passion to take the gospel out into our neighborhoods and our communities, into our workplaces, to our families, and to our friends as you have called us to be uh, your ambassadors to the world you've placed us in. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, if y'all would stand with us, I do have a, a couple verses on the screen. I want you to see what Paul says about this first song we're going to sing, All I Have is Christ. And see if you see that in these verses. Listen to what Paul says. He says, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss, have you heard that several times already? I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and <coughs> share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. When you see that, count as lost for the sake of Christ. Count as lost for the sake of Christ. This is as Paul is saying, Hallelujah, all I have is Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus is my life.
to that fourth verse, another one that could be maybe like a little bit, oh, give you a little bit of pause. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow, and the sun forbear to shine. It's another reality. And in that, it should drive us to all the more live as Jesus has called us to live. And a verse that will come back up later this morning, but I wanted to read it to you now. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works. Why? And give glory to your Father, who is in heaven. And so this last song we're going to sing this morning um, reminds us of a couple things. That God has called us to uh, go where his light is sending us to go. But at the same time, we need to seek him diligently so that our relationship with him can, is continually growing. Um, and recognizing that we need him and then go where he calls us to go. <clears throat> Lord, I find you in the seeking. Lord, I find you in the doubt. And to know you is to love you. And to know so little else I need you. Oh, how I 
wickedness towards us, your enemies. God, you, you came and you drank the cup of God's wrath. It was meant for me. It was meant for every person in this room and every person in this world. God, you drink that cup. And so now because of that, because of what you did, we can come before you and admit just how desperately we need you. We can see with clarity how we have sinned against you, God. When you offer us forgiveness, when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us. And you offer us forgiveness, and not only forgiveness, but you give us a seat mm -hmm. at your table. Amen. God, that we would do that for our enemies. God, that we would love them the way you have loved us. Would you bring freedom in all of our hearts today as we are reminded that we have been bought with a price. And that price is the precious blood of Jesus. And that blood brought us forgiveness and freedom. May we love like you love. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Be seated. <clears throat> Well, good morning again. I get to stay up here this week, so look at that. Um, <laughs> all right, Luke 19. If y'all would go ahead and turn to Luke 19 for me this morning. Um, we're going to look at a familiar story, uh, one that you know. Patrick will wear the same shirt today, man. <laughs> yeah, you look good. <laughs> um, I wish I had bought like three or four more of these. I love these. I've got several colors. Yeah, incredibly comfortable. They, of course, they don't sell them anymore. So, yes, it was. So, um, sorry, y'all missed out on these shirts. They were great. Uh, so, <laughs> so Luke, Luke 19, a very familiar story from Luke 19, um, where I, I just want to think. We're going to look at the story, but then we're going to kind of take a principle from the story and. and do a survey of Luke and see how this principle kind of plays out through the book of Luke. So you may have an opportunity, since I'm a teacher, I can't let you just sit there and listen to me the whole time, to chat with some people nearby, to find some things in the book of Luke. Uh, so if you don't have a Bible with you this morning, just go ahead and get Luke up on your phone, because um, you're going to have to talk to me a little bit at least today, okay? So the story in Luke 19, who is this story about? If you've got your Bible open, who's it about? Jesus Yeah. Okay, so it is about Jesus. Thank you for saying Jesus first. Uh, yes, it's the story of Zacchaeus, but it is a story about Jesus. So let's just read through um, this story briefly. I guess I should get my Bible as well and open it to Luke 19. I remember this. I love, I love this story as a kid. Um, I don't know why. Uh, maybe because, I mean, I was never that short. So I don't know. I've always loved this story as a kid. Think about climbing a tree to see Jesus. So cool. All right, so Luke 19, 1 through 9 is where we'll start. Follow along with me. He entered Jericho, and Jesus entered Jericho, was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. Oh, you've seen tax collectors before. And was rich. And he was seeking to see Jesus, who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. He was a short guy. Uh, so he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, religious leaders, uh, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Ooh. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. So I just want to start by looking at a, a couple little points from this story that, that kind of jumped out at me. But then there's something that Jesus says right after this that's going to be the focus of what we're going to be talking about today. So um, 
you know, I guess you could use this story to be to encourage someone who's short, to say Jesus loves short people too. I guess you could do that. I don't know. I don't think that's the point of the story, but it's true. Jesus does, does love short people too. Um, but you got Zacchaeus, right? Zacchaeus is a tax collector. Uh, we know tax collectors um, hated by uh, the, the other Jews uh, because of their, their cahoots with the Romans. And uh, you can see here Zacchaeus has defrauded people. He's rich because he's taken more than he needs to take. And he can keep whatever piece that um, he doesn't have to give back to the Romans. But he's seeking to see who Jesus is. He, want, he knows Jesus is passing by. He's heard about Jesus. Um, and he's seeking to see who Jesus is. Uh, but then he couldn't. So he climbs this tree. He's just trying to catch a glimpse of Jesus. I don't think there's really an effort here to get to Jesus. Just something about wanting to see Jesus. Just wanting to see him. And then when Jesus passes by, what does he do? What does Jesus do? He looks up. Sees him. And calls him out by... <coughs> Name. I don't know how he knew Zacchaeus' name, but besides God, um, besides that piece. Uh, he calls Zacchaeus out by name. And then what does he do? He invites himself over. Great, right? I'm coming to your house today, Zacchaeus. Come on down from that tree. I'm coming to your house to stay at your house. I'm going to come have a meal with you, but I'm, I'm coming to stay with you. And the response from the religious leaders is... He's a sinner. How could you go stay with him? He's a sinner. He, we hate this guy. And uh, Jesus says, hey, I'm coming to your house, right? <coughs> so through this meal, what happens to Zacchaeus? He's saved. Yeah, we see that, right? Um, and, and we see it uh, very clearly in verse 9. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. Since he also is the son of Abraham. I'm going to come to that phrase here in a second. It's kind of interesting. Um, salvation has come to this house. And Zacchaeus is immediately changed. And how is he changed? What does Zacchaeus do? Repent. Repent. Give him back. There's action behind the repentance, right? Um, he's giving back. Uh, he recognizes the wrong that he's done. He's going to turn his life around because of his faith in Christ. And I love this, that Jesus says, hey, salvation has come to your house today, and you are a son of Abraham. Now, there was a point where Jesus is talking to some of the religious people, some of the Jews. <laughs> and you can find this in John chapter 8, verses 34 through 44. And at the beginning of that passage, these Jews, they say, Abraham is our father. Ha who are you to say all these things, Jesus? Abraham is our father. And at the end of that passage, Jesus says, you are of your father, the devil. Oh, okay. So, and then he's in the home of this tax collector. And what does he say? This tax collector has salvation because he is the son of Abraham. Woo. Okay. So there's some contentiousness here, right? There's quite a bit. Uh, you could see that that these um, that the religious leaders would be like, "Oh my goodness, did he just say what, what I think he said? That this guy is a son of Abraham? He has he has completely turned against the children of Abraham and the way in the job that he has chosen and the way that he has chosen to live. He has defrauded the sons of Abraham." And now Jesus is calling him a son of Abraham while also calling those who claim to be sons of Abraham of the father, of, of your father, the devil. Hmm. So there's a lot going on in this story, but I want to take the next verse as a principle for what we see Jesus doing throughout his entire ministry. And then I want to explore him doing this. Zacchaeus is just one example of what Jesus does throughout his entire ministry. He's walking through Jericho. He looks up. He sees Zacchaeus. He invites himself over. And then he sees life change come for Zacchaeus because of that relationship that's been made, because of what he's shown of himself to Zacchaeus. He's shown Zacchaeus who he is. And there's complete change as a result of it. And we see this next verse in this passage, Luke 19.10. 
For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus was on his way somewhere, right? He's on his way somewhere. And, and, and I imagine, um, you know, they may be the stop and have a meal or something like that, but for me, I'm the type of person, and uh, Bob and I were talking about this earlier, actually, want to be on time, right? We're on time people, okay? If I had been one of Jesus' followers, I would have been like, geez, we don't have time for this. Like, we got to get somewhere, right? Like, seriously, we're going to go to this guy's house? What? All right, I guess so. And I may have been very self-righteous in it, too. Like, we're going to go to this sinner's house, just like the other people were saying. But Jesus says, hey, here is a, what looks like maybe to other people a detour in the path that he's headed towards or on. But really, it's just him fulfilling that purpose of his ministry, to seek and to save the lost. And so, in a sense, by looking up to Zacchaeus and speaking to him and saying, I'm coming to your house today, he's seeking out Zacchaeus, he's seeking out the lost. And I want to see um, a pattern of that today. But I also want you to see why Jesus says this. Uh, this is an interesting cross-reference to the Old Testament. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Look what Ezekiel 34, 11 through 16 says. It's for, for thus says the Lord God. Okay, so who's speaking here? Jesus. Lord God is speaking. Behold, I, I myself, will search for my sheep and will seek them out. Keep going. As a shepherd seeks out his flock, when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. You've seen the word seek multiple times already here. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from their countries, and will bring them into their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines and in the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and on rich pasture. They shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, there it is again, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy, and I will feed them in justice. Who's speaking here? God. I will seek the lost. I will rescue them. I will have them lie down. I will bring them to good pastures. And then Jesus says, I have come to seek and save the lost. This is a proclamation of what? He's God. He's God. He is fulfilling. You talk about Jesus fulfilling the Old Testament. He is the fulfillment of all these things in the Old Testament. I have come to seek and save the lost. Ezekiel, the Lord God, I will seek and save my people. So we see that it's a declaration of who he is. For thus says the Lord God, God is the one who seeks the lost. Jesus seeks the lost and saves the lost. And so we see Jesus as God here. So Jesus' ministry was a seeking ministry. So here's what I want to do for a few minutes. I want to uh, survey the book of Luke and see how Jesus' ministry was a seeking ministry. And this is where I'm going to need your help. Okay? Get your Bibles open. We'll do the first one together. Go to the beginning of Luke. All right, we've got Jesus' birth. We've got Zechariah's prophecy, chapter 2, birth of Jesus. We got Jesus in the temple. That's Jesus out there talking to people. But I want to move forward a little bit. Um, we got the temptation of Christ, and then Jesus' ministry begins. Chapter 5. Really, into chapter 4, we see him preaching in synagogues and healing many, casting out demons. But chapter 5, we, we see um, some of the, the beginnings of this seeking ministry. So here's what we're looking for as we go through this survey. Jesus is out. He's out and about. How is he out and about fulfilling this goal of a seeking ministry? Chapter 5, verse 1. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their tents. So he gets into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. 
And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night, took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And uh, so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Okay. Jesus is by the sea, teaching. Gets in a boat with some guys. Encourages them. Keep fishing. There's a miraculous event here, yes. But then it's, hey guys, y'all are with me from now on. All right? So that's an example of Jesus out, about, and seeking ministry. So what I want you to kind of do, and you can do this with a couple people next to you. We'll just go um, kind of, I don't know if we'll go like a chapter at a time or so, uh, and look for other examples of Jesus and seeking ministry. So take a minute just to scan through, and most of your Bibles probably have headings to where you can kind of see what's going on here. Examples of Jesus in a, there's a lot of them. Okay, I've got my list of over 20 throughout the book of Luke, and you'll be able to find more. Um, just take a minute and look through chapters. Let's do two chapters at a time. Look through chapters 5 and 6 and see where you see examples of Jesus' ministry being a seeking ministry. Where he's out, engaging, approaching. Okay? So, yeah, this is group work time. Uh, can't help it. It's got to happen. Okay? So take a minute, look through chapters 5 and 6, and you, you just scan through and just give me little nuggets. Okay? So I'm going to give you a, a minute to look through. Chapters 5 and 6 of Luke. All right. Go for it. Talk about it together for a minute, and then we'll come back and talk about it for a minute, Sudi, and then we'll come back together and talk about it as a group. <laughs> you need a sip of water is what I needed. you talking about it and impressed. <laughs> All right, 30 more seconds. Actually headed to somebody's house when that happens. What else? On the mountain praying. Okay. So on the mountain praying. Eating with the sinners. Eating with the sinners. Okay. Heals the man with a shriveled hand. Okay. Okay. Lord of the Sabbath sort of thing here. All right. Okay. Goes to the tax booth. So he's why Jesus is at the tax booth. I don't know. Maybe he's paying taxes. But he goes to the tax booth and he engages with the man there. Calls the rest of the apostles. Okay. Calls the rest of the apostles. He's out with them. He's got to be meeting these people somehow, right? All right. He's in the grain fields picking grain. Gives an opportunity for a conversation about why he's letting his disciples pick heads of grain. All right. Um, all, uh, so there's several there that we see. So let's. 
let's continue. Check out chapter 7 and 8. What's he doing in chapter 7 and 8? for a minute here, chapter 7 and 8. <laughs> See what you can find. Thirty more seconds. See what you can find. There's a few in here too. Okay, got quieter that time. All right, what'd y'all find in chapter seven and eight? Shout it out. Pharisee's house to have a meal, right? Okay. What else? Town of Pernium, so going town to town. John's I heard somebody else say another one. Go ahead. John's disciples came to him. Okay, so engaging with them. engaging with other uh, uh, disciples of John, encouraging them and comforting <laughs> them, and giving the helping them know who he is. All right. Went to name. Went to name. That's kind of fun, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you know in West Virginia, Welch, West Virginia, what's the name of that church there? It's the name community. So. Um, that's kind of cool, and it comes from this story, as we learned <laughs> last week. Um, he's at the gate of the town of Nain, and what, what happens there? Funeral procession, and so he engages in the funeral and in the process. There's a lot of miraculous works that happen here, but God's, Jesus is engaging in all of these areas. All right, anything else? He's on a boat at some point. He's headed to Jairus' house at some point. So those are just a few examples, and if you continue through, and I'll just run through my list here real quick, but if you continue to dig through the book of Luke, you see more and more examples that Jesus is out seeking, to seeking ministry. Um, so listen to a few more of these, and then I'm curious if you can come up with some other ones from your own memory. Uh, so in chapter 9, in the desolate place near uh, Bethsaida, um, in chapter 10, he sends out the 72, and he encourages them to go into houses. Uh, chapter 10 as well, he's at Martha and Mary's house, has a meal with the Pharisee. In chapter 13, he went on his way through towns and villages. Um, chapter 14, things are getting, chapter 14, verse 1, things are getting very contentious with the, with the Jewish religious leaders here. And look at what happens in chapter 14, verse 1. You flip over to chapter 14. Things are like, whew, he, is, he has said some stuff. Jesus has told some parables and said some stuff and has upset some people. And so chapter 14, verse 1, it says, One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. So you know that there's some, this relationship is not great. But where is he? He's at their house having a meal. And they're watching him carefully. And then he heals again. Um... Chapter 17, he's on the road in the story of the ten lepers. Chapter 18 is where he's with the children, and, and they say, hey, get these kids away from here. And Jesus says, no, 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 let the children come unto me. So he's, he's even engaging with people's kids and honoring parents by honoring the kids. Also in chapter 18, verse 35, he's on the road to Jericho. In chapter 19, he's on the Mount of Olives. Chapters 20 and 21, he's in the temple right after cleansing it which is interesting. Goes in, flips some tables, and the next day he's teaching there. Yeah. Chapter 22, another meal, eating with his disciples. And then, of course, crucified, buried, and resurrected, and he doesn't stop this seeking ministry. On the road to Emmaus, in the locker room with the disciples, where he eats again, by the way. They give him some fish. So these are just some examples. Over, over 20 instances that I found just with a quick survey through Luke of, of Jesus seeking the lost, Jesus 
uh, being out there, Jesus engaging with people where they are, at meals, on the road, at the temple, in homes, in the synagogues, on a boat. And this is just the start. So think about what you know from the other Gospels. What are some other moments that stand out to you where Jesus is just out in life, but also out in life ministering at the same time? I've got another six that I came up with off the top of my head. Woman at the well. What would you say, Jason? The thief on the cross. The thief on the cross. Yeah, there's even seeking in that moment. Yeah, okay. Uh, the woman at the well, Samaritan woman at the well, thief on the cross. I didn't have that one. Good job. Graveyard. In the graveyard with the man that was like in chain, would break the chains. One of the women the graveyard. Oh, after his resurrection. Okay, I got you. Yeah, so at the at the empty tomb. Yeah, and they thought he was the gardener. Yeah, okay. <coughs> Where else? This is his first miracle. The wedding. The wedding at Cana. Yeah, so he's at a wedding. Enjoying the wedding. All right. Any others? Yeah. Okay, the woman who's going to be stoned for adultery. All right, yeah, and he's there and steps in and speaks truth into that. Christy, that's what you were going to say, too. Okay, any others come to mind? I've got a couple more. These are good ones. I didn't think of some of these. Samaritan woman at the well, yep. Yep, we did get that one, Andy, thanks. Oh, the pool at Bethesda, right? Yeah. At Lazarus' house. About oh, with the disciples cooking fish on the seashore while they're out in the boat. He says, hey, put the nets in on the other side. And then they get to shore and he's already cooking something for them. They're like, okay, Jesus, thanks. <laughs> so we see in Nathaniel under the fig tree, like when I saw you earlier, looking and seeing, right? So Jesus' ministry was a seeking ministry. And so what I want to encourage you with today, of how, how does this then apply to us, is this note right here. And this is, this is us. This is where it comes to us. Jesus has sought us. He has found us. But his ministry, this it just was a seeking ministry. His ministry is a seeking ministry. Jesus' ministry is still a seeking ministry. It's just that that has been, that, um, that role in a sense has been passed to us. And so let's look at a few passages of scripture that support this idea that we have a responsibility now to be out. To be about, to be with people. Uh, this, the Bible says, this is of great importance. Gathering together, right? Don't give up meeting together because here we can encourage one another. Here we can strengthen one another, right? Um, here we can just build relationships with people who are like-minded in faith. But then also, go. This can't be it. Go. Go. So let's see some examples of that. So there's a few passages there, Holland. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, you know, we know this well. Uh, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We got to be out there. We got to go. What else we got? Romans 10, 14 through 15. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Oh, it's a beautiful thing to proclaim the gospel out there. Luke 10, 1 through 2. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. We can be ones, we can be those laborers who go out, who go out. Second Corinthians 5, 18 through 20, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. It's a ministry he has given to us. That is, in Christ God was reconciled the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. He's given us that message. Therefore, we are, are ambassadors for Christ. Ambassadors have to speak. Ambassadors have to go out. Ambassadors have to engage 
Ambassadors don't engage with just with like-minded. <coughs> Ambassadors engage with the message with those that disagree with them to try to encourage and bring reconciliation. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. God making his appeal through us to be reconciled to God. And in this passage that we already looked at, you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, put on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So, this ministry of Jesus as a seeking ministry that we see an example of in the way that he saw Zacchaeus, he, he engaged with Zacchaeus, he, um, he, he sat with Zacchaeus, he stayed with Zacchaeus, a man who was seen as just the worst of the worst. And then other examples, engagement with a Roman centurion, engagement with a Samaritan woman, um, engagement with, with someone who who has a skin disease over and over and over and over and over again. We see Jesus put, being in position to serve and minister to and encourage and bring salvation to people of all different walks. And that ministry of reconciliation has now been given to us. That ambassadorship has been given to us It's still a seeking ministry. He uses us to find those who need Jesus and share the truth. Look, we don't do the saving. I, I know we don't do the saving. If I, in fact, that's something impossible for us to do. Jesus tells the disciples, look, with man it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. But we do proclaim the truth, and then we let God work. We seek, we share, we let God work. When we were in Guatemala in March, they allowed the, uh, the, the, um, some of the student leaders of uh, Cademan's uh, Gap I squad to um, to lead our teaching, and one of them taught based on this phrase: "Ministry is life, and life is ministry." And I was thinking about that in terms of what we see Jesus doing. Right, He's just living out this ministry day by day, and He calls us in, as ambassadors to do the same thing. And so I was I had read something recently, um, I, I think from John Piper that did that encouraged me in that direction too, and I could not find that, but then God um, allowed Google to help me find this one instead. So, <laughs> Google is on our side sometimes. This is from Paul Tripp. I like Paul Tripp. He's very biblical in his teaching uh, and very practical in his teaching. And he says this, title is ministry is life and life is ministry. Appropriate enough, right? If you're living in a broken world as a sinner among sinners, then every situation, location, and relationship you encounter requires ministry. Every situation, location, and relationship you encounter requires ministry. What is ministry? It's not just the calling of the paid professionals nor limited to scheduled activities on your calendar. In biblical terms, ministry is not about a time, a place, or a job description. It's a heartfelt willingness to respond to the spiritual need that God puts in your path anytime, any place. This certainly includes participation in what your church schedules, but it must be far more. We must view every dimension of our life as a forum for ministry. Marriage is ministry. Parenting is ministry. Friendship is ministry. Living with neighbors is ministry. Work is ministry. Life is ministry. And ministry is life. When we divide our existence into two separate parts, ministry and life, guess which one gets the short end of the stick? Guess, what, guess which one has to get by on your leftover time? your leftover energy, your leftover finances, and your leftover passion. His implication is there. Ministry gets the leftovers. If you see ministry as something that you do when you step out of your life, that is, when the church is programmed and scheduled some form of ministry for you, then the vast majority of your life is yours to use for you. But Scripture teaches the reverse of those priorities. It challenges us with the reality that nothing we have belongs to us, we don't have a life divided into God's part and our part. It's all God's part, the whole thing. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, 1 Corinthians 6.20. This means that we have been brought into relationship with God, not only so that we could be rescued from us, but so that we may be part of God's rescue for others. Our life exists for his purposes, 
We were given life and breath to help maximize the glory of another. This is why life is ministry. Remember, every facet of life is a forum for ministry. You will never face a day that is not filled with ministry need and opportunity. Are your eyes open to the need and are you capturing the God-given opportunities? And then he goes on to quote Matthew 5, 13 through 16. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise, glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. So ministry is life, and life is ministry. Uh, Ligonier Ministries has this one article, and they say, If we are to imitate God in the task of missions and evangelism, we must show at least the same effort, indeed greater effort, in finding the lost as we do in looking for lost pets or valuables or those types of things. After all, aside from his glory, human beings are the more important are more important to our Creator than anything else. He has a passion to seek and save the lost, for that is why Christ became incarnate. Luke 15 shows us that there is great joy in heaven when one sinner repents. So we too were once lost in sin before the Lord found us, and Christ found and saved us through the ministry of others, whether through our parents, a friend, attending church, or many other means. So let us seek to be used of Him to seek and save the lost. So what does this look like? So here's the encouragement. Here's the Here's, here's the rubber meets the road application. Go out to eat. Pray for the waiter or waitress. Go to the town events and get to know people. Invite your neighbors and friends over for dinner or maybe follow Jesus' example. Invite yourself over to their house for dinner. Especially if, they're, especially if they're, you know they're a good cook. Like, I'm coming to your house for dinner. Too. See how they respond. Go to football games. Don't always use the ATM. Get to know the tellers. Go play trivia at Bridgewater or Cornhole at the brewery. Take people out on the boat. Play a round of golf with an unbelieving friend, even if you're as bad at golf as I am. <laughs> sit by the pool. Go to the gym. Dance at the Ruritans. Play bunco at the country club. Sit on your friend's porch and talk. Invite your friend, kids' friends over. Coach, volunteer, learn the cashier's name. Join the book club. Break your neighbor's yard. On and on and on and on and on in ways that we can be out there, all with Jesus on our lips, being cities on a hill, a light that cannot be hidden, that many might come to glorify God. And as in Acts, the Christians in Acts, there's this one phrase at one time that they say, these people who have turned the world upside down. We too can be ones who turn the world upside down, but we have to go out into the world with the message of the gospel in order to do that. So be encouraged this week. As an ambassador of Christ, as one who has been given the ministry of reconciliation, this is a ministry that's been given to you. Go seek the lost and proclaim the gospel to them. For the glory of God. Heavenly Father, would you show us opportunities? Help us to have our eyes up, looking for the Zacchaeuses. And looking for opportunities to proclaim the truth of who you are. Or to seek out the lost. And to take our eyes off ourselves. And put our eyes on the world around us. And then may we return here and engage in, in small group Bible study, engage in worship on Sunday mornings, um, and go together, two by two, see opportunities. Hey, come with me, brother, come with me, sister. You know, let's go talk to this person about Jesus. And we might encourage one another and build one another up for the, for the task at hand, for the ministry that you've given us. Lord, everybody enjoys different things in here. Everybody likes to get engaged in different things. Or may our purpose for engaging in them be, uh, yes, for the enjoyment of life, but more than that, for more and more people celebrating the glory of who you are and living in that in relationship to you through Jesus Christ. So Lord, go with us wherever we end up. We take the gospel with us. And we pray for our team in, in Welch right now as they are uh, you'll be wrapping up their time uh, serving there in this season soon and, and headed home. God, would you give them um, alertness as they drive, uh, good uh, conversation and, and continued fellowship and safety as they get home later today. Um, Lord, this is a day that you've given us. Uh, may, we, may we rejoice and be glad in it and use it in a way that honors and glorifies you.
In Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all have a great Sunday.